Hello and evening, everyone. You're you're watching and listening to uh, Med Talks Book Club Off the Shelf. Uh, unfortunately, Zubair Patel, our um, fellow friend, couldn't join us, but we are uh, graced with Fahim Shakur as well as Sana for this discussion. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, so today's book is about um, when breath becomes air. So it's so the author's Paul Kalanithi. So this is a story about a 36 year old um, who is training to be a neurosurgeon um, and finds out he's been diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. He later dies on a Monday, uh, March the 9th, 2015, surrounded by his family in a hospital just over 100 meters uh, from the labor and delivery ward where her daughter Katie was born. Um, so a bit about the book itself, it's, it's, it can actually be read quite um, quickly. It's simple, yet the language is very vibrant. Um, it's comprised of a foreword by Abraham Verghese. I think he only met him once, but the, the way that interaction and what he found about Paul, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very touching and again, it's, it's very vibrant in the way he communicates his thoughts on the matter. Uh, but then this is followed by a prologue and then two parts titled In, in Perfect Health, I Begin, and then part two being Seize Not Till Death. This was followed by an epilogue by his wife, Lucy Kalanithi. Um, so if, if I delve a little bit about the prologue, it's, uh, it's where he recalls his diagnosis and the implications. Um, one statement that still stands with me is about the re relationship between humanity uh, and responsibility. When Paul started to develop a persistent cough, uh, he states, um, she was upset because I wasn't t talking to her about it. This is with a reference to Lucy. She was upset because I'd promised her one life and given her another. So through this book, uh, a self-discovery around various themes that we hope to uh, discuss uh, within this one hour. Uh, I find myself being aware of not just his mortality, but also my own. Um, so the key message for me was this. It was not about dying, that it is at some point certain to touch us all. It was about how we choose to live and what mark we leave when we do depart at a point unknown to any of us. So what is clear is we're all vulnerable uh, and being vulnerable is not a weakness. Uh, it is a consequence of circumstance, and it takes much more stand, uh, strength to reveal your vulnerabilities. This is certainly something that Paul does within his book. Uh, so it's through his love of literature and relationships, he uses as an aid to uh, contain his suffering and hope to leave behind a place that was better without him in it. So that's kind of my uh, understanding of the book itself. Um, so for him, what, what were your perspectives about the book? Yeah, thanks, Mehran, uh, and for giving such a lovely introduction to the book. Um, so this is a book that was on my bookshelf earlier, uh, and I was really happy that you chose it when Breath Becomes There. Uh, there's so many themes to discuss about this tonight. I, I felt it was a poignant book. It was a touching book. Um, as a doctor myself and the, the main person, uh, the author, protagonist, whichever word you want to use, main character, he was a doctor himself. There was a lot I could relate to throughout the whole book. Um, the whole journey about the stage four lung cancer and how he dealt with it and his family and the different interaction um, was really quite interesting uh, and a lot to delve into. Um, just the meaning of life that he talks about. Um, and what it means to him, uh, a, a life well spent, and, and what to do with it when you know time is running out. Um, so, so there were just so many different aspects to the book, which I found really touching, and uh, it's a heartwarming uh, story. Um, and I won't spoil the ending just yet for people watching and listening, but but really, it's um, yeah, it's it's a very moving book. I thought. Yeah, thank you, Fahim. And what were your perspectives, Sana, when after you read the book? After I read the book, well, as I said before, I've got a bit of a rule that I don't Google authors uh, until I've read at least one of their works. So I was really surprised to know that this was published posthumously and everything. So it was, it was moving, as Fahim said, but I think it moved me a bit further and faster than I thought I expected to be and I what I loved about it was it was just so transparent his his description of everything that was happening his experiences he didn't water them down at all and it was still it was very much it was like reading a screenplay it was really vivid he was excellent at describing everything which is 
fantastic because he was a brilliant writer, but it just hits home how much, especially as healthcare professionals, we see our patients go through and they're quite, I think, especially in oncology, because I work in oncology, those patients are usually trying to um, look a lot stronger and look as if they're more resilient than they actually are, especially in that moment where they're surrounded by other people who are going through the same sort of thing. So I think the fact that he was so raw about it, um, I think that did move me. I think moving is the right way to say it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly a, a moving book, isn't it? It's, um, yeah, you can, I think there's everything uh, for every, you know, for everyone in terms of the, there will be aspects of this book that they can clearly relate with. Um, I guess if, if we move on to the first question or first statement to, to discuss is what what's the best thing about this book? For me, um, the the language and you can you could tell that he was really into his literature. Um, he he referenced uh, so many books that um, have clearly uh, given me and Fahim uh, food for thoughts in terms of whether we need to actually look at these books into more detail. Just because of the way, uh, you know, for example, Religio Medici and so, so some of the classical text um, that we haven't really thought about. But you could you could tell that. Uh, the importance of meaning, um, the importance of relationships really struck out. Um, so I think that that's certainly kind of re-influenced and reaffirmed our choice of aid why we're doing this, because we want to develop ourselves as well as uh, acquire knowledge through this process. Um, but that's probably what I'd say was the best thing for me, uh, in addition to so many other things. Uh, what about yourself, Senna? What was the best thing for you about this book? I think the best thing for me was how personal it was. He brought um, all of his experiences literally from his father and how he was as a doctor and he brought that into what he was trying to be like as a doctor and then he brought his wife's sort of involvement into all of his cancer journey even his relationship with his oncologist was quite personal um, everything was very emotive and I liked that as well I don't know if that's related to the language but everything was very it was extremely vivid everything he felt was portrayed so excellently you can't really deny it there was no ambiguity about anything that he was feeling I think that was the best thing for me just how personal it was to him and it was it just gives you it gives you a perspective that you probably don't see yeah thank you Sam what about yourself eh? <clears throat> um I think <clears throat> the whole story is gripping uh which i found really interesting the concept of you know neurosurgery which arguably is the most difficult speciality in medicine and how you've got this unforgiving call to perfection in that speciality and then trying to marry that up with uh perfection in his own life and how he's using metaphor similarities to explain all of this i thought i thought that was impeccable for me in, in just how he's dealing with his impending mortality head on bravely the whole description of that and like i said just with the intensity of this neurosurgical background which is always there in the background just makes it for just i think an enthralling book yeah, no, and I guess we, there's so many quotes we can come come away from this book. Uh, this is certainly something that we will touch on, but some, you know, for example, human knowledge is never contained in one person. It grows from the relationship we create between each other and the world, and it is still never complete. So kind of emphasizing the fact that the journey of discovery is, is never ending. Um, what's the least thing you liked, or what's, what's the thing you didn't like about the book, Sana? The ending was a little bit abrupt, but that's obviously because of the nature of the ending. So um, I didn't really like that. I think Fahim touched on it. It is so well written. It doesn't feel like you're reading a memoir or a, or anything that remotely relates to nonfiction itself. It's, it's almost too good to make up. Like he's written it so beautifully and just the way it ends. And I think the epilogue, not that I didn't like it, but I think it moved me to almost tears. Yeah, I think it moved you to tears, didn't it, Faye? Yeah, yeah. No, I think yeah. for me, uh, I, th I think for me it was um, maybe just the lacking some uh, parts of it, um, self-reflection or humility um, in, in the ways looking at, obviously, you wanted him to like dig deeper into his drive for perfection a bit, but he sees it as sort of like trophies along the way of life 
Um, and when you compare it to other books like Henry Marsh's Do No Harm and stuff, you know, another neurosurgeon, um, and that's always mentioned when you talk about a neurosurgeon, these sort of books, I felt that it's more in books like that. So I think it's just that lack where, you know, even like when they go to the couple's council, there's a part in it, you know, when their marriage is on the rocks and so on. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's sort of like you two are coping with this better than any couple I've seen. I'm not sure I have any advice for you. And that may or may not be true, but I think some humility and self-reflection in these sort of pivotal moments in the book and in his life would, for me, have made it a better book. Did you almost feel as if it was too glorifying? Because especially with the... Um... So the uh, the forward, he mm -hmm. only met him once, but yeah. the the way he writes as though he he had known him his whole life. Um, mm -hmm. So um, so yeah, so, the, so the, certainly there is an element of that. But it's I really struggled to find something I didn't like about this book. You mm -hmm. could potentially argue the the length because it's something. It's probably mm -hmm. the quickest book I've read, uh, spanning yeah. over three days. Um, it's so, for you, Meryl. <laughs> I know exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I usually am uh, 11th hour when it comes to these books, but, but yeah, so it's, uh, but maybe it was part of the, the gripping uh, narrative of this book. So it, mm -hmm. maybe uh, that certainly helps. So how, how did you find the structure for him of this book? Yeah, I, th I thought it was intelligent. I mean, when the cancer weakens his body, his, his writing style improves in a way, in a perverse sort of way. But I just feel like he's abandoned this heroic self-image of himself, right? And then and then you, you've got this bit where he, he's really grappling with everything going on. And so I liked the way that structure, it, it's a book that gets better in a way. Um, so, you know, you've got the bit about them moving home. And I think I mentioned in, you know, when we were discussing this off air regarding the rattlesnakes at, at their home backyard and so on, and sort of a bit of humor things that you might see and it's a good argument for not handing your homework in on time isn't it something like that uh, so I like the structure of the, those sort of um, friendly banter you might have with your sibling at home and then obviously the counselor I think you know and the, the marriage sort of structure and how that's a thing in a way that was sort of um, like an allegory for how his health was fading as well so whether he did that intentionally or not but I thought that was interesting so there's a clear structure in terms of the progression of the illness and and also just the way he structures it, you know, talking about how he started as a, a medical student even before that, you know, the dissection table, you know, as, you know, we were both medical students from Maryland, you know what it's like, the dissection table, having that structure, focusing on that, moving on and so on, and him having actually a, a spouse who, who was a fellow doctor, quite common in the medical fraternity as well, you know, someone that he went to lectures with. So I, there was a lot there that, that I thought was very good in terms of the structure. You know, it keeps you engaged the whole book. You know, it's it's a it's a page turner, isn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Senna, how did you find the structure? I like that a lot of the um, chapters started with flashbacks because it just meant that he was tying in all the little bits of his life into essentially what is the end. And I think maybe the arrogance or the or the reluctance to sort of take the take the veil away from his imperfections. I think that's probably in the fact that he's trying to make this book like it's his last piece of work, isn't it? Like he he said somewhere, I think in the book, that he's outlived the Brontes and he's outlived Keats, but he's not written anything. So I think this is as Fahim said, it's a good way of saying it. It's like a trophy for him. So but um I think the little the little sort of imperfections and the little um anecdotes from his childhood and um, when he was a med student and all that, I think that really translates into, I think it's just well tied in together. There's no, he does it really well, considering it's the end of his life. It, he ties all the knots really well. There's not like a, there's not a plot hole or a plot point or even a tiny little patient sort of plot that's left that you don't know about at the end. He follows through everything right till the end. Yeah. it's just... Uh, I took quite a lot of interest in, especially the two parts, the, you know, in Perfect Health I Begin. So it's the the kind of na naivety, I guess, uh, of youth, uh, how he makes certain decisions and comes through that. Um, you know, for example, uh, in terms of work experience, what, what to do with the spare time, he chooses a summer camp as opposed to um, a science lab, because this is this is the kind of journey. But, but then uh, 
I think that there's a clear difference in terms of human interaction between the two, because obviously you're going to have a lot more human interaction in terms of uh, the summer camp. And you could tell how important relationships were with how he interacts with his family and friends later in the book. The The second part was more the mature self. Uh, that's where it felt. Um, as Fahimi alluded to, you know, th through the journey um, of what he found and what it ultimately means, uh, I think, and the language kind of... Not, not improves, but it just it becomes even more deeper. Uh, and the way it's, it's actually quite a spiritual text, there's lots of references to Christianity as well as uh, um, biblical quotes. Um, so I think he's uh, clearly, uh, I don't know if he, if he regarded himself as someone who was religious, but clearly he, he felt helpless and vulnerable and, and put this down to a higher power. Um, and he could relate that through some of these texts. Uh, that come about uh, in this book. So, so yeah. So that's uh, that's why I thought about the structure um, in terms of medicine. And I, I know Fahim, you touched on the cadavers, but what where what does it teach us about the role of diagnosis, career choice um, within this book? Yeah, I mean, as a doctor myself, there's a lot you can relate to in the medicine here. Okay, so I mean, uh, and the way, you know, he just talks about it and he's picking out the abnormalities in the the radiographic uh, imaging of his own, you know, tumour and so on. And the x-rays early on in the book. Uh, and uh, I think the primary care physician is probably a bit perturbed by that. And I think a lot of people can see that when you become the expert patient yourself here. Yeah? So in terms of he knew certain things better than the doctor treating him. It's clear to say uh, and that can be useful in a way because he always had that nagging feeling as well that he thought he had a cancer he had that feeling and he couldn't be brushed off so I think I learned that as well and just this concept of if you think it is and you've got that nagging feeling go with your instinct so for me moving forwards I think that's really important if a patient comes to you with this nagging feeling that something's not quite right I think they often know themselves best you don't need to be a doctor but if you know there's something going on take it seriously take and do something now about it so in terms of the the diagnosis obviously you, you mentioned I think it's fair to say it was a delayed diagnosis from what we read um it, it wasn't you know it was months of his symptoms before before it's found so the impact a delayed diagnosis can have on you is, it can be catastrophic it can be a bad thing it's obviously depends on each condition but i think you know for whatever cancer it is generally by and large for many cancers the earlier you find it the better the treatment options i think is a, a good maxim um not for all cancers but i think by and large so i thought that was interesting just the way he was diagnosed you know late on and then in terms of the treatment and obviously in terms of the statistics he was always interested in the statistics wasn't he if what's the chance of me getting and i think this is this can happen certain patients want to know the chance of where will i be you know tell me how long i've got where some don't want to know at all okay and some will be like you're the doctor you're in charge you just deal with it and i'll just sign up to it and i think that can that can be just cultural thing maybe generational there's different attitudes and things but that's something worth exploring perhaps because like i said he's a high achieving individual highly motivated he's got a career plan a 40-year plan what he wants to do tell me what i can do and then i can deal with it and in a way that was his coping mechanism wasn't it um and so it's it's interesting to see how he coped with his diagnosis talking going back to your question as to how someone else would have coped with it and, and i found it it was a really interesting story in that sense <laughs> Yeah, no, I think when, when we think about diagnosis and as well as, you know, if, if you're perhaps from a medical background, you uh, you get so attuned to making certain clinical decisions about other people uh, or sometimes feel as though you may have taken the eye off of the ball about your own self. Um, sometimes kind of perceptions of your own abilities can be heightened or not exactly reality, which perhaps I think he was, he had a, he had a nagging feeling, but it was, you could, sense that he wasn't willing to discuss it with with Lucy um and on reflection he was you know, had developed a persistent cough he had a number of uh, you know number of months where he had lost weight um and it's it's just the fact that you know he was uh, he's in his 30s I think the likelihood of getting lung cancer and you being a non-smoker statistically it's very very low you're talking about 0.1 percent if not less than that uh well, obviously it depends on where you live but um, and air quality etc um, but I think um, 
that's how I found uh, the whole concept of diagnosis quite quite interesting and challenging. What about yourself, Sanando? How does this resonate in terms of your own kind of career paths and choices? Well, what struck me was, I think Fahim touched on it as well, that he dealt with it a lot differently to how a non-expert patient would probably deal with it. I think that that was probably driven largely by the fact that he'd achieved so much at such a young age anyway. So mm. if um, if it was someone like me in my 30s, I wouldn't have achieved that much if I had got lung cancer at 36 or something, that's it, because I've probably not done anything compared to what he's done. He's had, he was a neurosurgeon, neuroscientist. He'd had huge impact in terms of his research. Um, he, he was towards the end of his residency. He'd achieved such a lot. And so in terms of like a legacy, he'd already left, he, he's already sort of starting to build one. And obviously, as you guys will know, when he's sort of towards the end of his legacy, he had loads of students who already admired him, had learned techniques from him. He had like a whole history, probably about 15 years of patients who he had helped. I know there's obviously people you can't help so much, but I think he dealt with it with a lot more class and a lot more calm than I think someone like me would or someone who's not a healthcare professional. I think he dealt with it quite admirably, actually. Yeah. No, I fully agree. Um, we're getting a, a bit of feedback through our social media. So um, this is a message from Sam. Uh, thank you. It's, so it's Sam. I'm glad he appreciates the discussion. Um, and uh, Fredo Sheikh, um, I guess you've joined late for the discussion, but certainly it's it's a top call. Uh, it's a book called When Breath Becomes Air by Paul Kalanithi. So, so can choose to stay tuned. It's it's a fantastic book. Um, certainly recommend it. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, and then, so one of the key themes of this book is mortality, isn't it? Um, yeah. But at the same time, it's about meaning of life. Um, but him, how how do we? If we if I go to you about meaning of life, how how does this come about in the book, and what's your own personal take on that? Uh, well, isn't everyone's meaning of life based on the life of Brian? But no, joking aside, <laughs> uh, and Monty Python, no. I think, um, which obviously has gone into culture, hasn't it? But I think this will be part of culture in terms of meaning of life. I think um, the way he looks at it, obviously, is it, it's like I said, you know, he's trying to do aliquots of time. And he's, he's judging his meaning of time by, you know, actual specific time compartments, uh, compartments, what I can achieve by this age, this age, this age. And so the meaning of life is done by productivity, I guess, by time quotient, you know, having a child, having a book out, finishing my neurosurgery residency, being attending, they're all achievement based. Like I said earlier, going, you know, alluded to the trophy cabinet, so to speak. So his meaning of life to a, a large degree and maybe self-worth or just a self, um, you know, belief system is based on achievements, I felt, you know, and, and judging the meaning of life by what you've actually tangibly achieved. And we have a book here, so, which is a great achievement. Um, going to my own, obviously, Mine is uh, reflected with a uh, religious background. So, you know, obviously in, in how to spend time uh, productively. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, in terms of that and, uh, you know, for me, it's the, the, there is, a, you know, different religious framework for how things are governed by how life has meaning. And that includes obviously family, occupation, profession, um, even entertainment, the whole thing, the balanced concept of one. And I think we're all struggling with this concept of what is a balanced, meaningful life. I think this is the whole thing. And I think we all have different sort of guides to help us, you know, whether it be popular culture, religion, culture, friend circles, there's so many impetus and so many actually influences that can change you as to what a meaningful life is. Um, and, and I think we're all straddling that sort of uncertainty as we're going through every day. But I think if I come back to, to the crux of the matter, I think it's m m finding that you can't expect to have tomorrow as a given. And I think that is the meaning of life in many ways. And to focus on what you can do now, because, you know, one day you won't have another day. And, you know, you need to be in a position that you're ready to, you know, end, you know, if you believe in a maker or if you don't believe in a maker that, you know, that there's an end. And so to have that 
meaning so that you are content when you get to that stage and not actually grappling with fear or perhaps uh, beside yourself and anxiety and and so this book reinforced these sort of things he obviously had his own journey uh, especially once he got his diagnosis and it made him think about meaning of life i have my own we all do but i i think what really helped in this is that his background in the humanities you know how can you be a good human unless you love the humanities a famous scholar once said you know and you it really comes out in his understanding of english literature and so on i can tell he was a better doctor because of all of that Okay, so, so, and and I think you know something that we've also talked about off air. You know this concept in in the USA where they do a pre medical degree and so on. You can see some of the obvious benefits in that. It's made him a really rounded doctor. You know, so um, a lot there for me to learn and think about and reflect on. And I'm still reflecting on the book. Yeah, fantastic answer. Thank you, Vane. Um, so now, but in terms of your your understanding of meaning of life, or well, what does it mean to you, and how does this kind of resonate with the book itself? I think first of all with the book I think I was really interested I think that's why it's such a quick read as well I was really interested to see what his conclusion was but he sort of doesn't really come to one apart from what Fahim said you just have to the meaning of life is accepting that you're going to die and I think he says it somewhere in the book that everybody knows they're going to die it's just that because of his diagnosis he knows it more acutely so he, he still doesn't know when it's going to be he might have lasted 10 years he might have lasted 10 months 10 days and that's the same for all of us. Tomorrow we could just not cross the road one day and get hit by a bus and it'll be exactly the same thing. But I think for me, similar to theme, I think it is culturally and religiously affected. Um, trying to, I'm not so bothered about leaving a legacy on this world. I think I'm just, I think for me, I'm just trying to work in a way use my profession because i am a pharmacist use my profession in a way that i'm trying to help as many people as possible and i know that um in in our sort of belief of islam we believe that the prayers of other people can save you so hopefully all the prayers of all the patients i've ever helped with their paracetamols will take me to some sort of better afterlife um and just try not to do try to lower the harm that i inflict as much as possible because i think that Something that Henry Marsh's book and um, and this book, When Breath Becomes Air, I think what they both show is no matter how much you try, you nothing's ever perfect. You can try everything. You can do all the research, all the statistics. You can do everything. You can spend 20 years in the making, but you still might make a mistake or um, oversee something within yourself or within a patient. And I think that for, the meaning of life for me is that I just try to help as many people um, on my way out, I guess. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a very kind of profound area to, to look into, isn't it? I think meaning of life can be uh, defined by achievements. It can be defined by things you've started and you've finished. Um, and I guess meaning is something that you continue to evolve. Um, and I think the um, the way the way life throws curveballs and I guess if you look at COVID-19 for example um, trying to give uh, especially from a psychiatrist perspective trying to give that purpose that meaning for, for individuals who unfortunately either find themselves in a really difficult situation or have lost someone uh, is very hard but it's uh, a, a lot of it's it's around acceptance or a lot of it's around responsibility uh, not just for yourself but also the people around but trying to understand and being very present um, in the moment, I think that's that's very key. Um, I think some of the critics uh, felt that because of the fact that you know you have to try to live each day as it was your last was an excuse to actually live in the wrong way is is incorrect. Um, I, I think it's it's more the fact that uh, once you have a kind of awareness, you, once you have a kind of very much a knowledgeable uh, standing as to what needs to be done, both for yourself as well as those people around. They will give you meaning, uh, and it's interesting how you talked about legacy. It's it's very difficult to to be on that journey to leave a legacy. It's it's um, I'm, I'm not sure whether you can consciously achieve it. I think something yeah. that just happens by circumstance. But you know, um, I I stand to be corrected on that. Um, there's there's certainly lots to think um, about this um, in terms of meaning. Um, but something we haven't really touched on is what role um does euthanasia play 
uh, as well as you know given the current circumstances um as well what what are your thoughts for him about where we stand with euthanasia because it's something that um it's fair to say it feels as though it's coming closer and closer to home where many of the european countries are adopting where it's it's actually legal um and uh, there may be some some drive through medical professions to actually you know let's let's rethink let's talk about it again to keep the conversation going um what are your thoughts for him um i think euthanasia is is growing in uh, interest i think it's fair to say uh, um in new zealand they had the recent election and and for those of us who don't live in new zealand what you may not know is in addition to the election which we know the outcome there was also a referendum done on uh, legalizing cannabis and also on actually euthanasia as well uh, and that's because you know, it, there are other countries that already practice it. I think uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, uh, I think Quebec in Canada and so on. Some states in the USA. Um, so it's gathering momentum across the world now. And uh, whether we, we like it or not, there is a growing movement. And also, in, and often, and I think people might not realize, often in medical circles in those countries as well is where it gathered momentum. So it, it, it's gathering momentum in the UK. I think the Royal Colleges are, are looking at this. There used to be a time when they wouldn't discuss it. Complete opposition, then move to neutral. And then obviously in the, in the way pendulums work, that will then become, I think, towards a positive. And and it's a case of each doctor having to deal with this in their own way because it may be a matter of conscience for them. In the same way, I think, uh, you know, the medical profession in terms of the sanctity of life and regarding abortion and so they can decide not to get involved. There may be some sort of a safeguard for doctors who may not want to do this uh, to be involved and that, that would not cause any uh, consequence to their professional basis. So. I, th I think it's a huge ethical issue, um, and, and I think, you know, time's going on. And all of these ethical issues in a time when we're working at the moment, it, it, it's making, you know, there's a lot many things to think about. I have my own views, obviously, from a religious standpoint, you know, which I think um, are mirrored by all the Abrahamic faiths and other faiths as well in terms of uh, opposition to that. Um, but, but as I said, uh, society does ch lead to regulation and changes in laws. Um, and that's something to be mindful about, uh, which is perhaps partly where in terms of medicine and things, often people's religion or some of their own personal beliefs are kept as a backseat and just evidence based medicine is uh, the proponent. Um, so I guess it'll be a case of showing the evidence for euthanasia in terms of benefit and how that's brought about as the argument in order to convince people in forthcoming referendums, which I do imagine will happen uh, in the UK. And uh, we all know what happened in the last referendum in the UK. It can be quite divisive, right? So, uh, but it is one way of sorting out the issue, even if not maybe for a generation, but for at least, you know, what a few decades or something of that nature. So watch this space, I think, Mehran is the answer. I'm, I'm keenly following what's happening in New Zealand. I gather that result. I think is out, but they're not releasing it yet. So I think that will give us an indicator as to where society is going. You know, it's, it's another liberal democracy in the Western world, isn't it? So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you highlighted, you know, the Abrahamic faiths because um, they've been very much fixed and constant through time about uh, certain aspects, including euthanasia. Um, and obviously we're, we're living in a very dynamic landscape, aren't we? Things that have, uh, were accepted 30, 40 years ago are no longer the case and people are getting found out or prosecuted or uh, being shamed for some of their previous comments. So it's it's very it's, it's very difficult, um, I think, for, for watchers and, uh, and listeners. When, when we talk about euthanasia, there, there are two types. There's a voluntary euthanasia and the non-voluntary euthanasia. So I, I guess we're, we're talking a bit more about the voluntary euthanasia, but it, assisted suicide, and, uh, at, the, at this moment in time, it's illegal because uh, this is based on the Suicide Act of 1961. So what if you do assist someone uh, in dying in, in that kind of way, I think it's 14 years of imprisonment. Uh, killing yourself is not seem to be a criminal act. Um, but from a, from a mental health perspective, this is these are one of the common presentations that we do see and the, and the need for kind of psychometric and psychological evaluation is required um so so yeah so you know, it's, a, it's a very deep dynamic area but it's um uh, let's let's watch the space um mm. so what what's what's your feeling about 
uh, dying and what, what role euthanasia has to play? Well, <clears throat> I don't know if you've seen it, it's a Spanish film called uh, Mar Adentro, The Sea Inside. It's by the same guy, it's directed by the same guy who did The Others. It's, it's a fantastic film if you can handle it. It's quite, it's quite sad at the end. So it's basically a, it's like a stuntman. He, well, a adrenaline junkie to type, really fit young man. He jumps into the ocean or what he thinks is the ocean. He hits his back, the back of his neck on a, on a black rock and quadriplegic for the rest of his life. So he spends the rest of his years arguing with the Spanish courts, trying to get euthanized by his wife. In the end, it does happen, spoiler alert, it does happen. And it's based on a real story. But I think watching that, it blurs so many lines. Of course, as Fame said, and you as well, Meron, I'm a Muslim and my views do mirror the Abraham, uh, those of the uh, Abrahamic faith. I would probably, I wouldn't know what to do if I was ever supposed to, because I don't know how it works for doctors, but pharmacists, if you choose not to um, be involved directly in something that you would rather not be for religious reasons, you still have to signpost your patients mm. to some service that can offer it. So I think even that act of signposting, we're nowhere near euthanasia yet, I think mm. in community pharmacy and hospital pharmacies, but as, Mer as uh, Fahim sorry, said, I think in a few years, give it 10 years, I think it'll be very much like the topic at hand. And I know that things that are relatively minor, like like emergency hormone contraception, I think a lot of pharmacists, not a lot um, in um, proportion, but in absolute number, there are quite a few pharmacists who even the act of signposting their patients to another pharmacy who will definitely provide them with that help or a family planning clinic, they struggle with that on quite a deep and internal level to the fact to the point where they'll leave the sector and they'll go into a different sector of pharmacy so they don't have to deal with it anymore. So I think something like euthanasia, I think it's that's up to the doctors who have to deal with it. But um, I think in terms of even signposting, I would struggle quite deeply, but I complete, completely understand because you always have to put your self into that patient's shoes and I think if I couldn't walk if I lost a few of my senses if I couldn't take I think it's more of a dignity thing isn't it if you can't take care of yourself in a certain way you don't really want to be there and it sounds like you know or you might get better but I think in some kind of things like that film he he was never going to get his limbs back so that those are the kind of people I don't think it's a decision people take lightly either um mm. And usually they fight for it for years. So I think if you're fighting for it for such a long time, you should, I don't want to say something that's a bit too controversial, but I think respecting the fact that this patient or this person in front of you has made a decision that they've definitely thought of. And obviously it's, a part, it's still a partnership. And I think that's the scary bit for healthcare professionals as well, because whether or not you sign post or whether or not you have a direct involvement, you are sort of a link in that chain. So yeah, I think a, a sticky one, but I think, yeah, Fame's right. It's going to be on the cards in a few years. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's trying to get the needs of the, of the person addressed, isn't it? Um, and you always reserve that right, but um, you can't just end the conversation, uh, <laughs> you know, when they come to you. So it's, uh, I know what you're saying. It's, uh, it, and everyone's got a different threshold in terms of what they're able to work with, what they what they aren't, uh, and and that's perfectly fine. Um, so, so yeah, no, it's let's let's watch this space. But and you know, we, we discussed it here, by the way, in, in this uh, book club. <laughs> so, um, you know, in, in the years ahead. Um, so, how how does this relate to the COVID nineteen pandemic? I'm going to come to you, Sana, first. Um, there's there's obviously there's um, about meaning about loss of life um about legacy there's there's loads of things but how how is this book relevant to the current landscape at the moment so if you look on social media especially a lot of young people feel like they've lost a whole year of their lives a lot of uni students feel like they've lost um education people feel like they've missed out on promotions everyone just feels like it's a lot of time to have lost and it definitely is but i think that's what Paul must have felt that through this one diagnosis, he's just lost so much of his life that he didn't even have yet. So this was, if you believe in fate and stuff, COVID was always going to happen. Lockdown was always going to happen. We were always going to lose these times. 
Paul was always going to get lung cancer and be di diagnosed with it. So he was never going to have that time anyway. But I think it's just the idea of the potential that we have, that we recognize within ourselves and other people. And I think that in terms of legacy, I think people probably feel like they've lost the opportunity to leave as much of a sort of deep set and meaningful legacy, even though give it a couple of years and people are not going to forget about this, but they're going to have moved on in a way that will have probably compensated for the months that they've lost. And in terms of, it's, I think, being present in the moment. And I think you're right as well. I think the the beauty of Paul's approach to life was that even when he was diagnosed, even when he was properly towards the end of his life, he was still trying to make every day count a little bit for him. And obviously his values, morals, and his um, his outlook changed but every day was like almost 100 percent meaningful and i think even in the pandemic where we should so this is like a motivational book in a in a way even though it ends tragically we can look around and think can we have some sort of new goals associated with not associated with pandemic but something that's achievable in this and then we don't have to look back and feel like a load of regret for a year that didn't have to be lost anyway yeah yeah, well, what are your thoughts, Fahim, on the COVID-19? Yeah, I think COVID-19 has been really a, a reset button for many people in understanding and finding out what they, is important to them, whether that be how they spend their time, their relationships, their career or lo loss of career, rechanging career, you know, obviously, which obviously is relevant, having children or not having children, to the obvious parallel with Paul's book, obviously, he had a child late at the end of the, the book, and that was important. Some people are in two minds within this pandemic as to how that would work with all the restrictions and so on, bringing a child up in this environment, how that means. So in, in many ways, there are there's some parallels, um, but I think it's facing mortality, and, and I think that's what COVID-19 is about for people, is actually many people i know people you know who've died and if and if you know someone who's been died or very sick with covid 19 then you can relate to this book because it talks about someone who's very sick and he dies so there's an obvious similarity there um in, and it's a it's a part of history which will remain i mean we're going through this covid 19 time and you know we know it's going on to 2021 obviously 2020 is written off with this and people have already started writing books about this pandemic in the same way paul wrote a book about what he's going through the books will be coming out about this stage in time people are keeping very detailed memoirs or notebooks and diaries of this time which is what paul did he kept a diary of what was going on which is why he was able to write it people are writing regular columns in newspapers about this time paul did the same thing yeah so so there's a lot of um parallels with, with his life his book uh, the transient temporal nature of life that people are grappling with every day uh, and i think even with the whole concept of restrictions and you know you've got these protesters as well who don't want the restrictions they want to continue with life because for them that's really important as opposed to other people who say no we should have even stricter restrictions so people are trying to muddle their way through um what we're going through and and in a way that that's an allegory for what you know what Paul was doing he was trying to muddle his way through as well how he could get through this uh, life limiting condition as well in the same way other people are doing yeah so it's it's um it's difficult isn't it because he continued to find meaning despite his um psychological frailty despite his physical frailty impacting on his ability to carry out tasks, for example. It's interesting how he left the admin related tasks and focused on the very much the hands-on surgical elements uh, at, the, at the beginning stage of his, uh, his illness and how that progressed. Um, but it's, it's the constant movement and the constant movement of feeling as though you're progressing into some place better than where you are now. And I guess that's, for me, perhaps that's what, what the meaning of life is. And uh, it's for everyone to kind of uh, take stock uh, and just understand the vulnerability. Um, of, uh, of, and I think we all knew that that degree of vulnerability was always present, but because of the fact of this virus, it's made us really much more conscious in terms of how everyday interactions, how everyday trips are very much different now. Um, you know, the, the new normal keeps being banded about. Um, so, so yeah, so I think there's there's a lot for people who are uh, unfortunately in the, the COVID-19 uh, situation. Um, and we, we can see on, on social media, people that we know wouldn't really resort to social media to talk about their journey are now doing that through 
through Twitter or through Facebook or through YouTube videos, um, you know, keeping logs and everything. So, uh, so hopefully someone who watches or reads or listens to it may find it of benefit and just kind of normalizing or validating their experience in the sense that, you know, uh, someone else is also going through that. It's okay. It's, it's okay not to feel okay. Th those kind of messages. And I think that's, uh, that's quite important and uh, about social cohesion uh, and what it means in, in the general landscape at the moment. Um, so, it, so we've got about 15 minutes. There's quite a few bits uh, to cover. Um, legacy. Um, is legacy important? For me, yes. Um, how do you leave a legacy is another question. Um, you only really find out once you've, once you've perhaps departed, but it's just making sure that every kind of interaction is, is a, a beneficial one, at least for the other person. Um, and, and leaving something of knowledge or substance, um, you know, obviously of Abrahamic faiths, the, uh, the, the importance of legacy and charity is very much important. Um, and people do uh, to look at it uh, at various stages in their lives. And unfortunately, some, it's something that gets seen at, towards the end or not, not the end, but the latter stages of someone's life, just because I guess the, uh, the vulnerability has become a bit more clearer. But um, but certainly the, uh, the role of charity as well as uh, taking it forward is important. Um, Fahim, what about legacy? How does it, how does it fit in with yourself? Yeah, I think it's really important. Um, in, in a way, taking out the ego part, obviously, legacy can be seen in that way as, you know, as an egotistical thing. How will people remember me? I want them all to cry when I'm not there and these sort of <laughs> things. <laughs> Even though you're not there, so it doesn't matter. But I think it is important. You know, people have wills. What is a will but not a form of a legacy, right? And, you know, it's one of the few reasons even solicitors say you should meet a solicitor in life is to get a will done. So I think um, for many people reading the book, they'll be like, who haven't done a will, they'll be like, okay, I should write down things I want to give on to people so a fundamental tangible way there's that but there's also i mean i, I, I was saddened there was a, there was a death of a junior doctor just last night um and then obviously in terms of legacy it just that i was reading the uh, sort of eulogy and other sort of obituaries that people have been writing already and you can tell that the legacy was obviously the way he interacted with people, his kindness, his selflessness, all of these characteristics he had, his mannerisms. These are all part of your legacy that people remember when you're, when you're gone, you know, uh, and the outpouring of grief that comes out, it, it can be a testimony to the, to the legacy. But I think, uh, you know, it's about the what you did as well. So like you, you mentioned, charity uh, is one form, but I think, you know, as, as people have said in times gone by that, you know, um, service to others is that the rent you pay, uh, pay for living on this earth or walking this earth. Um, and I'm sure you, you know who, who said that. So these are the sort of things that, you know, this concept of service to others, or whether that be through institutions formally or not. I don't necessarily think you need a name to have a, a legacy. So if you do something, a charitable institution, but say you haven't got your name attached, I think it still counts. <laughs> okay, if it's done in an unnamed fashion, although the ego may want you to have your name all over it, you know, and remember it's the Shakur dynasty or whatever it might be. But I don't think that's necessarily needed in order to be doing the good work. And in, there's an argument to be made that it's even purer sense this legacy if it's done philanthropically without a name yeah so that's something i, I have thought about a lot in the past um but but this concept of legacy obviously his book is a form of a legacy and it may be even that he grappled with the idea of having a child i think there's a lot of ethical interesting issues there in having a child and knowing that you're about to die and what that can mean but for him that was obviously a form of legacy in leaving that uh human you know his daughter behind to follow perhaps in his footsteps or not um and you can see just the legacy in terms of coming back to family and incorporating that he became a doctor right his dad was a doctor and you know even though he never wanted to be one i'm sure his dad was really proud of him that he became a doctor like him which father doesn't like it if their son was to follow in their footsteps so to speak so there's a lot of things when you unpick it in terms of legacy there but i don't want to finish everything and let sana you know see if there's anything <laughs> you want to add to that <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the Shakur dynasty now. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. That. I know. <laughs> hey, if Trump can have a tower, we can all have a tower, right? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, over, over yeah, to you, I think Fahim actually opened my eyes well with what he said, because to be honest, I think 
I think it's because I I'm part of the generation that is on social media a lot. So, so legacy to me is something that I know by definition is something that you pass on to the future generations or pass on the, something that's come from the past. But um, I think just the adding of and Trump as well is just everywhere. So just uh, your name attached to something. But I think you're right. The purity in the legacy lasts. It, it it lies in for me. It lies in the prayers of the people of whom I've affected. And uh, like you said, like I worked in Morrison's for six months. My dad worked in Morrison's since I was one year old. And I don't think he's been prouder of me, even when I was a pharmacist, than when I worked in Morrison's for those six months. So I totally get it. I think it's the it's the beautiful little pure things that connect you, not just with the people who, you know, you're connected to by blood or upbringing, like parents and kids and stuff. But I think you're right. The book is definitely part of his legacy. And um, now I think, I think legacy is like a like a relay sort of thing, like it's passed on, and now I think it's Lucy's turn to sort of carry on that legacy. Maybe, maybe for neurosurgeons, or maybe for his family, maybe to pass on his message of, or pass on sort of you know the 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 aim of trying to find the meaning of life. I think maybe it's her turn, um, whether she wanted it or not. It's just her turn to pass on that legacy, maybe to their daughter. And, to the rest of us because I know when I was reading the epilogue it was it was almost identical like it mirrored the the writing style of Paul's which is quite beautiful so maybe he's passed that on as well and I think the legacy of all those writers and poets he's brought down and passed it on to all of us because look we're all going to read a bunch of books now that we've read this one yeah no exactly and you know Katie's got big shoes to fill um <laughs> but um but yeah it's 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 difficult, isn't it? And I think the, the other concept is about destiny. Um, and I, I find myself now, you know, everyone's got kind of a five-year plan, 10-year plan. Obviously, he had a 40-year plan, etc. Uh, and it's, it's one of those conversations that do come up quite uh, commonly, whether it's in professional circles or personal circles. But it just talks about how, uh, it just makes me think how naive it is to actually think to some degree of how sure you are in terms mm -hmm. of to, to make those, you know, the necessary steps to achieve that kind of destination. Um, so, um, so yeah, so destiny, uh, Senna, I'm going to start with yourself. Um, what do we understand uh, through this book? And and for him, you, you did talk about the unfortunate incident of, of that 26 year old, um, and you know, our thoughts and prayers are with him uh, yeah. and his family. Um, something very, simple. but looking at all the uh, the accounts around him, his personality, um, it really does feel that there is a clear role for legacy in youth. Um, and so he feels as though, you know, um, uh, I feel very humbled in, um, in the case of how he's remembered. Um, you can clearly tell he was some, someone of very uh, profound substance. So, um, so yeah, so on that note, Senna, just about destiny, how does that sit with you? Well, I think you were right in that having this, like all of Paul's plans were just thwarted by one diagnosis. So I think maybe being sure about the things we can control is probably what I took away from it. So every single day he was trying to make decisions that affected as far as he could possibly reach. But he was he just stopped making long term plans because he didn't know whether he was going to be able to or not. And I think he asked Lucy as well, didn't he? Tell me if I've got a few years and then I'll go back to surgery. Or tell me if I've got a few months and then I'll go do this. Tell me if I've got a few days and then I just won't do anything. So I think that's, I think it's the element of control. I think even with the COVID pandemic, we're trying to control as much as we can, but maybe it's just God's way of showing us that maybe we can't control everything. We can only control, I think one of the scholars in the Islamic past said it, that you've only got control over your circle of influence. So Paul started influencing his circle of influence. He started trying to make his marriage better. He he started a family. He um he can reconnected with all of his family before he got too ill for that to happen. And I think that's what I took most from it, that everything that we're trying to control so far down the line is probably never gonna happen. Especially when I speak to more specialized healthcare professionals, whenever you ask them how they how they got into their jobs, their answer is always, oh, I fell into it. Like they all had a different plan 
in their minds and then something happened and then they turned to that so i think that's quite inspiring and i think it takes a lot of the burden off you as well so just keep going and doing your best every day do as much as you can actually control because we do have a little bit of a degree of control um in our everyday lives but i think trying to reach so far i think it just ends in a little bit of disappointment yeah i think it's um when we talk about circle of influence once we start engaging in that i think it's fair to say that circle broadens out doesn't it and we don't really know how how large that circle is and i guess that's where um that's where you know the the future is very much untold and we don't really know where our influence reaches um we're getting a little bit more feedback from the audience so this is abdul yunus um he hasn't read the book but he finds certainly our conversation very interesting and insightful so thank you for that um this is another message from Ariella. wasn't a great fan. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, you know, everyone has a right yeah, for their the opinion. first not raving review I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. um, you, you sure have more space for characters. So, um, you know, I would love to hear further thoughts from yourself. Um, and, uh, and this is just another feedback from Sam. He, he liked your comments earlier, uh, just about when we talk about euthanasia um, and uh, mortality. So so that's his comments there Thank, thanks sam i'm sure i know you <laughs> <laughs> no influence there whatsoever yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um definitely um yeah uh, how much how much control do we have yeah i think i think it's a, it's, it's a real good question which i think philosophers have uh, discussed for centuries so i'm not going to give you a good answer in two minutes <laughs> That's number one, but but I think um, as I said, there's obviously religion ha has a uh, one way of saying predestination and things written for you and so on. And I think people would know that you know things are written, your occupation, where you'll die, what time you'll die, and things, and which uh, you know no matter what you try and do. Um, and it's interesting. I'll come back to it again. Paul didn't think he'd become a doctor. He became a doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was his destiny, isn't it, in a way? Um, and, you know, I think there's that Samuel Beckett thing, I can't go on, I'll go on, this concept of just continuing to try and finish your destiny, whatever that might be. So I think this concept of destiny, it, it, it's a really interesting one from a philosophical philosophical point of view because you're always thinking, well, if everything's written, then I shouldn't need to try hard. I'll pass the exam without trying hard because I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail if I won't. So, so you can really get quite uh, despondent if you're always thinking and it's how you actually color that destiny in a positive or a, a negative way um so yes you, you might get robbed but you still buy an alarm system you know to try and prevent it or something you know it's whatever measures you might make to make yourself feel that you've taken preparation yeah you might fail that exam but did you even prepare for it and so i think it's always people are always thinking it doesn't matter whether you believe in destiny or not the stars are written for you whatever you believe in uh you know um the concept is really back to how that comes back to you and how you lead your life that's the important part to take away from the concept of destiny and that's where i think we can all agree on in making it coming back to what we said earlier about making it as meaningful as you can in order to fulfill your destiny whatever that may be uh, I think that lends nicely to favorite quotes. Um, I think this was your favorite quote, wasn't it, Fahim? Uh, Even if I'm dying until I actually die, I'm still living. Um, yeah, yeah. I love that quote. I love that quote. Why? It's, it's an awesome quote. Yeah, the reason why is just because philosophically, uh, you know, if you look at Darwin, Nietzsche, and other philosophers, other people, they always saw that importance of the organism living and how important that was so you can break that quote down to a biological level to a esoteric level to a philosophy in many different ways and it's a truism isn't it until you are dead you are living okay and mm. and, and and really that's what this book is until he is dead he's still writing you know and and so and even when he's dead things are happening people are still reading his book but it, it is a there is a sort of completion when you die that is an end of some degree but it doesn't necessarily mean everything has ended but your life has mm. ended that biological aspect of your life which we all understand has come to an end and until you've actually hit that point and it's also partly because i think people wonder what happens afterwards it, it leaves you that mystery of mm. well you haven't explained to me or and you know many people have come up with different theories or so on as to what exactly happens but no one here at the moment now can tell you what happens 
you know so so i think it's a for many people it, it's it's a really interesting equation of until you're actually dead you are living and and just how precious life is like we said this doctor who died just last night how precious is life you know you know, you know and if you've got these reminders uh, on a regular basis then then you will take life seriously and not just think it's entertainment all the time i, I think it does hammer that whole that point as well that there is a balance yeah there's a time for entertainment there's a but there's a time to be serious as well yeah, and no, I fully agree. And I think it always gives the, the notion that you've got an opportunity. Don't feel helpless. Don't feel, um, you know, life has given you um, a, a really awful, you know, throw of the dice, uh, in essence, for some people. Because, you know, in Paul's situation, yes, it's very rare. That he, and it happened to be, you know, a high-flying neurosurgeon who was going to be uh, many places um so the, you know he could have gone down that route of bargaining why me why has it happened to me etc cetera, etc cetera, which is which is quite normal but at the same time it's you have to try to develop from there and um how you're actually going to use the time that you have um so Senan, i think your favorite quote was the main message of jesus peace be upon him uh, i believe does that mercy trumps justice every time um why is that important to you uh, this one actually, it was um, it touched me because it was sort of positive and negative because I know mercy and justice they have sort of mirroring concepts in um, our faith as well, and we're always taught that we hope that God judges us with His mercy and not with His justice because if everything was just, it means that every silly little thing that we did that might have hurt someone it had an equal and opposite reaction, which would mean that there probably would be almost no good left in the world. So I think something about his sort of experience, it was very, it was like an epiphany for him when he went into that church and he just went, I get it, mercy trumps justice every time. And it just, I think it opened my eyes a lot. It's like a breath of fresh air really, because you just sort of, you look at how he's been dealt in his life, the way you've said it, he could have, complained and just thought well I've done so much work all my life nearly four decades of it and now I'm dying but I think it's a it's I think what I took from it is that whatever hand you are dealt just try and take it with a bit of mercy in your own heart as well and hope that mercy envelops it so try not to do the mathematical equation for the whole of your life because you're probably going to fail and instead try and find the good things the positive things then try and extract some sort of meaning i think this i think maybe for me that is what it concludes as the as a purpose of life is to envelop everything in mercy i think that's why at the same time as his him having a, an epiphany i think i had one as well <laughs> fantastic for that and and yeah i think that that quote kind of highlights the the role justice has to play but if um if you were to make a decision if it was based on forgiveness and compassion then that's where mercy would trump the the role of justice um so uh, so yeah no it's a, it's a fascinating quote um I'm, I'm mindful that i think you know we have gone over an hour in terms of discussing this book um but we do have a, a really interesting book to discuss for uh, for next week, so uh, not next week, the uh, next month, last Sunday. So this is this is reckoning with risk. Uh, and for him, you chose this book. Do you want to tell us a bit more about this book? Yeah, so reckoning with with risk. Um, it's a book that uh, came into my life um, over a decade ago, uh, and it was one of my dad's best friends who lent it to me, and he'd made so many copious notes in this book. Uh, and you could tell it had a huge impact on his life. And then I came across it again on my shelf the other day and I thought, well, actually, we're living in a time now in the pandemic where even with all the miracles of science and technology, and I love science and technology, but there's a lot of ambiguousness right now. There's nothing certain at all. I can't even tell you if my restaurant's going to be open or closed tomorrow, you know? There's no certainty whatever's going on at the moment. I can't tell you many things with certainty anymore. And this book deals with the whole concept of risk. I mean, look at that picture, the, the front cover that you're showing, the guy sitting on a chair at the top of this tower. <laughs> Remarkable. I yeah. love that photo. And I, and I think we've talked about photos and covers, haven't we, of books in the past and how they can lend it itself. But we want certainty i think it's fair to say a lot of people want certainty but we're living in an uncertain and dangerous world 
right now is the time. To me, it felt like a really perfect book and how we can learn to make sense of statistics and turn ignorance into insight. I thought, to me, I think that's worth uh, actually exploring next month. Fantastic, fantastic. So Fame, out of five. Okay, um, so it was a great book. Um, uh, lots to learn, lots to reflect upon. He's a doctor himself as well, you know. I, I love that. So we got that in common. I'm not going to give him a bad mark, am I? Uh, four out of five. Um, and, and it's a clear four uh, reasons for why maybe not quite five is just like some of the things I mentioned earlier, you know, as to the worst parts of the humility and the lack of introspection, I think, which compared to like Henry Marsh's Do No Harm is, is apparent. So I know, son, I think you said you read that, but, you know, he, he really talks about that. And I thought Henry... As a fellow neurosurgeon, he, he delves into that really well. Um, and also just some of the concept in terms of meaning of life and, you know, th that sort of thing. Otherwise, I would have given it five. But it's, it's a solid four. And who am I to say? It? Maybe it is a five for other people. I mean, it was in the New York Times bestseller list for like 60 odd weeks, right? So <laughs> so for many people, it is a five. But I think four is not a bad mark. Yeah, easy four. What about yourself, Senna? I think a four and a half out of five because I think it's easy. The easiest book I've read in the in the past year it's the fastest book I've read and I was so upset when it ended that's I think to me that's the best kind of book that you're upset when it ends but I think in contrast to Henry Marsh's um, admissions and do no harm I liked that sort of authority even throughout the sort of period of vulnerability I liked that I think it um I think the two sort of par the paradox of it was really refreshing and I think that's why it's a it's a solid four out of five four and a half out of five just because I'm saving my five for something ask me in about 50 years and I'll tell you what my five is <laughs> fantastic great I I'm gonna go with five I was <laughs> I was gonna, you know, I toyed with the idea of four and a half, but I, I really struggled to find anything wrong with this book. It was just, uh, it was beautifully well written, um, and yeah, I just really enjoyed it. It was just cover to cover, three days done. Uh, I'm sure Fahim was really, in, you know, <laughs> fascinated how I actually finished a book on time, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's not fair. We won't discuss that on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, but no, th thank you again, Sana and Fahim, for, you know, being involved in this really insightful discussion. So it's obviously affected all of us in a, uh, uh, in a tough way, but in a positive way. And I hope mm. we can take the message forward uh, in future years, um, if we do indeed have that time. Uh, so thank you again, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and hopefully we'll also have Zubair back next month. Look forward to seeing him then. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs>